Today's episode of Hidden Forces is made possible by listeners like you. For more information about this week's episode or for easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you listen to the show on your Apple Podcast app, remember, you can give us a review. Each review helps more people find the show and join our amazing community. And with that, please enjoy this week's episode. What's up, everybody? I recorded an episode recently with Nick Carter where I didn't have a rundown or prepare for it in any way, and all of you really loved it, and I said that I would try and record more conversations like it, and this episode is very much in that vein. For Super Nerd subscribers, there is a rundown available, but it's the rundown for my episode with David Allen, which I thought I recorded this morning But what actually happened was that my end of the audio was totally corrupted and unusable. Not a pleasant experience. I don't recommend it. But David was super cool about it. And we're going to find another date to re-record it. So in place of that episode, I'm releasing this two-hour-long conversation with Chief Content Officer at Coindesk and former Wall Street Journal senior columnist Michael Casey, which was originally supposed to go out on the premium subscriber feed this morning and which I recorded late Thursday evening. Many of you already know Michael. Besides his role at Coindesk, he's also a co-founder of Streambed Media, the co-author of The Truth Machine, and one of the main organizers of Consensus 2020, which is the biggest blockchain conference with over 10,000 attendees and more than 300 speakers. This episode publishes on the first day of the conference, which lasts through the end of the week. As you can imagine, pulling off a conference during a mass quarantine isn't easy, but somehow Michael and the team at Coindesk managed to do it. The conference is all virtual, it's free, and they've got some big names, people like former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers, historian Niall Ferguson, Ethereum founder Vitalik Buterin. You can learn more about the conference at Coindesk.com and register to attend for free. So you literally have no excuse not to check it out. Okay, so what is this episode about? Like I said, there was no roadmap to this conversation. We started it off talking about music and movies from the 1980s and 90s, and that eventually led us to a conversation about Tom Wolfe's Bonfire of the Vanities and the culture of Wall Street after the end of the Bretton Woods gold exchange rate system and the deregulation of finance in the 1980s, And eventually, at about halfway through the full episode, we begin to get into a discussion about the calamity that is our current economic and political reality. And that conversation lasts well into the overtime, where we also discuss the future of fiat money, cryptocurrency, and the latest news about Bitcoin, including the news that leaked Thursday that legendary investor Paul Tudor Jones has begun buying Bitcoin as a hedge against what he calls the great monetary inflation, a, quote, unprecedented expansion of every form of money unlike anything the developed world has ever seen. It's another great episode, and if you like it, let me know. Comment on the Patreon post, tweet at me, and most importantly, rate the show and write us a review on Apple Podcasts. It takes a millisecond. In fact, You should do it while listening to me obsess over 1980s movies, especially my love for Danny DeVito. That's probably the least important part of the conversation and the part that you can most afford to miss. And with that, please enjoy this week's episode with journalist and author Michael Casey. Michael Casey, welcome to Hidden Forces. Thanks for having me back, Dimitri. Yeah, we had so let me catch up on what happened. I was telling you that I had a, a kind of just a really sad situation this morning. I had David mm-hmm. Allen on who wrote Getting mm-hmm. Things Done. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with the book. I think I am. Yeah, I certainly I think I've encountered it. Yeah. He's super famous. I mean, I hadn't mm-hmm. I hadn't read the book before. I, I didn't know about mm-hmm. it. 
And in any case, I prepared for it and I've been actually doing the work myself. It's really helped me. I'm in the very early stages of it. For those who are familiar with GTD, I'm just kind of in the early capture and collect and <laughs> whatever phases of the process. And mm. I booked him a studio in Amsterdam. He lives in Amsterdam. I booked him a studio. He was super cool about doing that because you probably, you may or may not know this about me, Michael, but I'm, I really hate having recordings where the guest is on the phone or there's a crappy recording. Even if the audience doesn't seem to care, I can't stand it. Right. I cannot yeah. stand it. I don't know how you feel about that. But anyway, he was cool about that. He went there. His audio sounded phenomenal. I checked it after the whole conversation was over. It was a great conversation. I sent mm-hmm. it to my editor and he calls me back and he goes, did you hear your audio? I'm like, what are you talking about? My oh, microphone no. was all screwed up the whole time and uh, we couldn't figure out what was wrong with it. So I had actually reached out to you before yeah. I even found out about that because oh, no. because with David, we hadn't recorded in overtime and I, I've been yeah. playing this by ear with you. I told you I did one of these with Nick Carter and it was really, really popular and everyone loved it. You know, no prep, just conversational. Yeah. And I reached out to you afterwards and I said, you know, let's do one also and let's find a time to do it. Maybe we can do it before consensus and mm-hmm. turned out, Yes, and but now, so we're. <laughs> this is uh, this wasn't planned, but it's great that you and I were planning on doing I'm, this anyway. I'm, I'm really sorry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm on the, in this sort of rather sad situation, but I I know that feeling. I really do. You know, similar moments of of writing books and and then suddenly realizing that you've somehow managed to lose you know one of the chapters of your manuscript or something like that. It's just these sorts of moments. Are Has that happened to you? I don't know if it was a full chapter, but I've certainly lost a lot of text and I couldn't figure out for the life of me where and how I lost it and why I hadn't saved it or whatever, right? It was, you know, I think probably before the days of autosave and that sort of stuff where you, you know, and I was, I was just never good at, you know, Have you- saving, <laughs> autosave, autosave helps me. You know, it's worse than losing your manuscript or losing the entire manuscript. You know, it's even worse than that. What? Have you seen Thoreau Mama from the Train? You know, it's David DeVito. I, David DeVito, it's a classic. I, I, I think <laughs> I did it years ago. But yeah, that, what, I, I remind me again what happens there. His wife stole his book uh, right. before he published it, and she published it under her name. Right. And it became a huge bestseller. Right. And she'd never published anything before. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. So, you know, it's all fair game. <laughs> Such It was a dark comedy. Dude, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I love that era, man. Right. Those some like great those. Comedies then. Oh my yeah. God! Yeah. Billy Crystal, yeah, Danny yeah. DeVito, yeah. Martin all, Short, all, all, all the National Lampoon Rick, stuff. <laughs> all those yeah. guys, yeah. everybody. I don't know, just a different thing, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I always wonder. Do you ever wonder if it's just everyone always feels like their time was the best, the time that they, you know? Yeah, probably. I think, and that's interesting. What is, what is it about our own? cultural makeup and what is it about that stage of your life that somehow it's so cool i just can't get away from 90s music it still make and this makes me feel so old i'm like i still feel like it's fresh i mean i'm like yeah that was edgy that's it it's avant-garde you know the the kind of stuff i was into in the 90s and it's now you know more than 20 years ago and so uh yeah it's once your genre of music suddenly becomes you know classic rock you realize that you've passed a certain threshold of life i think so but I yeah. feel the same way about 90s music, by the way. I graduated mm-hmm. high school in 2000. Mm-hmm. But there's a theory around this, and I believe I learned it from Malcolm Gladwell, and I may have talked about it once on this show, which is that the music that you listen to in particular between 18 and 20 mm-hmm. in that period of your adolescent development is the music that sticks with you the most, that brings back the most powerful emotional response. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, for sure, if you look back, those are the songs, right? Absolutely. Yeah. No, I I had to do a radio hit at one point back in Perth, where I'm from in Australia. And I came back and, you know, I'm obviously a few years beyond you, Dimitri, because this reference is going to be going way earlier back. But I was told to select an entry, you know, what do you call it? An an intro song. So that it was a little bit of a profile of me. I'm a Perth boy done good you know it left and gone off to the rest of the world and they're doing a little bit of a this is your life thing so yeah i gave them a song and i i gave them the it's just a particular guitar solo from the chain which is from Fleetwood max rumors album which just happened you know this is actually we're talking that's 80s actually so we're we're going back even further now but but you know because that's actually when i was in my teens i'm just really showing my age here and so 
I think it's the greatest album of all time and uh, or close to it. And that one guitar solo still makes me want to jump up and down and run around the room like a, you know, yeah. a headless chook, as, as we say. Yeah. <laughs> well, even me, for me, the 80s movies were movies that I would watch in the 90s. Mm. When I was kind of in my pre-pubescent years heading into puberty, <laughs> Where I want it to be, you know, just like you've seen now, I'm, I'm just full of movie references. My life is literally just movies in my head. But did you ever see the movie Big with Tom Hanks? Absolutely did. Yep. Right. Did. So, yep. you know, that's it, right? Like yeah. the kid that wants to grow up. I yep. just want to be big. I'm right, right there on the cusp of puberty. And there were all sorts of movies, even from the 70s, late 70s, that I would watch, like Porky's. <laughs> um, the Porky's trilogies. And I always say this because, you know, I, yeah. I grew up so much of my life. Life was spent in Greece right. every summer of my childhood, and we temporarily moved back as well. And it was really my home because yeah. we moved around so much. And after a certain hour in Greece, they would show anything. Right, like there's p- pornography. That, that was, was on that was TV. borderline porn. You know, that was uh, oh, there was, was porn, yeah, straight up porn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I watched uh, what was that show with David? De- David. People don't know that David Duchovny was a porn star. Oh, really? Before he became a movie star. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> he was a porn star. He was yeah. a sex addict, but he was right. also- I knew he was a sex addict. I knew about the sex addiction. And, and, he, was in, he hosted the Red Shoe Diaries, where he would oh. walk. He was like a guy with a dog, and he'd walk oh. around, and he'd like fantasize, and he'd tell a story. And uh, anyway, so- You know, I, I actually still think 80s, I don't know about movies, as I said, I, can't, I grew up- My formative years were, if you go by Gladwell's line, should have been the 80s, but I feel like- it's the 90s music. For me, and it's also like, that's when I started traveling. I started traveling at the end of the, at very end of the 80s. And, you know, through the early 90s, I was, that was when I was living in Thailand, was teaching English and writing. I had thrown all of my past out the window and gotten, you know, picked up a backpack and basically went off and tried to find things like myself. And so music- That's when had, you were with Anderson Cooper. That's when I, that's exactly, that's when I first, uh, you know, met Anderson Cooper in the Burmese border. but. Yeah, music was really important to me then because it was, you know, in my earphones, right? Everywhere you go, I was, you know, the Sony Walkman was, you know, you buy cheap, you know, black market copied cassette tapes in totally. the streets yeah. of Bangkok and then put them in your Walkman and then disappear up into, the, into Chiang Mai, into the hills with this, you know, I don't know. I was who was listening to Camper Van Beethoven. I was a fan of at the time and and an REM, uh, and that was sort of blaring in my ears as I was traipsing around hill tribes and things so you know i started reading more then too so i feel like i wasn't watching movies because i was at, you know particularly when i was in southeast asia I didn't have as much access to sort of western popular culture but music and books and things that was when i started to really just um you know i think some of my formative cultural ingestions if you like happened in, in that part of my life which was so a little bit more later developed than than gladwell's uh, theory so what books were you reading? And also, how are you getting them? Did you like buy a bunch and oh, yeah, brought travelers with you? would come through and so forth. So I read Herman Hesse's Siddhartha, which really impacted me. I read Zen and the Art of Motor- Motorcycle Maintenance at that time. Hmm. I, re- I remember reading Bonfire of the Vanities, which had just come out, and it kind of blew my mind in a way. To yeah. Write, you know, that was actually turned into a movie. It was. Starring Bruce Willis, which has that incredible you know, nonstop camera scene from mm-hmm. when he gets out of his limo yep. going through the back end of the hotel to get to his speech. Right. One yeah. of the greatest single shots in uh, cinema history. Yeah. yeah. Tom Wolfe was a genius. You know, he's one of those guys that sort of constantly blurred the lines of, of fiction and nonfiction in, in all of his writing and uh, found it really. Yeah. So he was, you know, I was, I, that was just before I decided I was going to become, you know, go back and give a shot at being a journalist. And so that sort of writing was really impactful for me. Was that the first time that, because that genre, the bonfire, the vanities genre, the, what's the book by uh, the author that wrote The Big Short, that other book that he Michael wrote? Michael Lewis. Michael Lewis. Mm-hmm. Liar's Poker. Right. Like that whole genre. Was the yeah. 1980s the first time that that genre came back into vogue? I mean, could you consider maybe, was there anything remotely like that in the, well, in the, in the, the 20s? Van- bonfire of the Vanities was a fiction book right but it was you know obviously felt very real because it was very raw and very you know drawing on you know all of that kind of excess of the moneyed 80s of course and liars poker was was non-fiction although i think you know lewis wrote it with fair amount of liberal license but Mm. you know i think the topic was huge at that point right we were coming out of the junk bond era michael milken and and, solomon brothers and you know louis renieri and and all of that and so i think that 
the first idea of Wall Street as this powerful beast that you know had a kind of a stranglehold on everyone's lives. I don't think people were fully aware of it until then, and, and it probably wasn't nearly as big. It wasn't Wall Street. We hadn't financialized the U.S. economy. Well, by that even back in those days, it was tame, but we were suddenly realizing how big and powerful these upstart young bond traders were in the late 80s, how innocent those times look now, right? <laughs> but ultimately, that was the first time we realized that there was a lot of money being made by a lot of fairly young people by just intermediating the, you know, transfers of wealth within the US economy. I mean, I think about it as well in terms of, you know, this isn't really answering your question, but I, I think those books and that cultural awareness are really important for the broad, longer narrative about how we've come to understand where we are now in terms of finance, mm. right? Because it set the stage for everything else. And then we need to think about like, how do we get there? Well, we got there because Volcker broke the back of inflation, right? And established a framework around which, you know, Wall Street could work. What we didn't do probably is to figure out how to like, you know, either regulate or at least disincentivize the kind of rather rapacious ways in which that opportunity was exploited by people who really didn't need to have that much power. So, you know, I think about these, the phases, like, like we basically... Nixon shock. We leave the dollar. The dollar leaves the gold standard in 1971. You know, the Vietnam War winds down. You get ultimately rampant inflation in that period because, you know, they can't pay for the war and the dollar has just been, you know, de pegged from gold and, and it's collapsed. And there's just massive inflation problems and the oil shock and everything else. Volcker comes in, just, you know, brutally drives the US into a recession in the early days of the Reagan administration with the blessing of the president and, right. then, and then wins, right? He sets the stage for what became the benchmark for all central banking after that. And by the way, now I think we are really at the cusp where that Volcker era is is being challenged like never before. We can probably talk about that a little later. But you know, you establish that and then then that's it. Wall Street's like party time, right? Because we've got the security and the and the confidence that we need when prices are stable to just you know start the machine running and it's from there that you know junk bonds were invented and Michael Milken comes along and the Solomon Brothers starts to sort of build up you know mortgage backed securities and everything starts to roll in that period people make a lot of money and all of a sudden you get movies and stories and everything else coming out of it so yeah it's an interesting year without a doubt and globalization. Right. Technology, the deflation, the combined de deflationary forces of globalization and technology and baby boomers investing, coming into their prime right. investing years, all of that stuff. I mean, it was- Yeah. Well, that's right. We had the Berlin Wall come down in 1989, right? It was like this victory, this kind of mandate, right? That's it. You know, capitalism won. So, so off you go, you know? It's crazy, right? Because you, you mentioned Volcker. Volcker came in in 79. That was around when Jimmy Carter sent a couple of helicopters to yeah. rescue embassy staff- in Iran that crashed over the desert. Right. It was like the yeah. trough of American self-esteem. And then 10 years later, the walls collapsed. Right. And I think, you know, it's hard for someone like me, and I wonder you, it sounds like you were born sometime, uh, maybe early 70s or late, or late, late 60s. Late 60s, 67. Late 60s, mm -hmm. 67. So you would have remembered that. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it's hard for anyone who wasn't around then or, or who couldn't have kind of experienced both of those polar opposite moments to appreciate that dichotomy. Do you think that, that that's something that isn't appreciated? Just how quickly that change was is only 10 years. We went from, you know, really questioning mm -hmm. America and it's our ability to lead and our ability to to be that great shining city on a hill that Ronald Reagan referred to us as only a few years later to then having won the Cold War. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I, I don't think People do appreciate how fast that time was, right? I mean, I think the 70s was an era of a lot of self-doubt for Americans, right? It was the era of inflation. It was the failure of the Vietnam War. Drug problems really started to hit hard at that point. Yeah, it was a really sort of gloomy period. And then 
Yeah, to turn you things get around. It's super dark. It was super dark yeah. in film too. But you see yeah. it in the in the in film culture of the 1970s. You can see right. that darkness. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we had and the, the weird thing about the music at that time, right? It was disco, right? Which was this incredibly upbeat, have a good time. But there was, you know, now we see all these movies that sort of you know give us a look back at that time series like The Juice, right? That give us that picture of like, yeah, into disco and like, you know, bell bottoms and everything else. But the dark underbelly was actually the sort of the bitter phase of drug addiction and and a really depressed state. New York was in its worst state possibly ever in those years, right? So, yeah, I mean, and this is why I, re- I think Reagan is in many respects so beloved because he really brought American pride back. You know, he he stood up and picked it all up again. You know, I, I think poor old Jimmy Carter gets a, a worse rap than he deserves. He was you know, handed a, a a poison child. Because that's the other thing I, I forgot to mention. Of course, is like you know, seventies was the era of Watergate, right? He, he right, absolutely. He was, he was given Nixon and Ford's mess, and sort of had to sort of try to pull away out of it. You know, after he'd taken the dollar off the gold peg, and you know, the oil shock, you know, the inflationary scenario that that he had to deal with was there probably didn't have the guts to bring in a person like Volcker or maybe, you know, he did, but, you know, ultimately it was Reagan that was able to just, you know, turn things around. So you can see why. Well, but I mean, when Carter approved Volcker, Volcker came in with the th- Carter administration. Yeah, yeah, I mean, okay. For some reason, I seem to think, think it was the early days of Reagan. I think you're right though. Yeah, it was. Okay. So, yeah, so he approved him basically then probably, yeah, the early days of his hardcore interest rate hikes would have yeah you know put the US economy into an even worse situation at the end of the uh, the Carter years and Reagan was able to just start off on that footing had a yeah. recession to to start with but could easily blame it on Jimmy and then by the end of his fourth term was turning things around yeah well 1981 was i think the most violent year in New York City's history wow the year i was born and i lived in New York at that time, I was born in 1981. We mm. moved to New York sometime around then. I was actually born in Cincinnati. And I remember I, I, this sort of has a point to it, which is that the darkness of the 70s, even though I didn't live in that period and I didn't sort of come to a place where my I have any memories of, of any time until like the early 80s, but I remember New York feeling unsafe. Right. You know, and I remember growing up in a culture of martial arts. Hmm. And I think that sort of Kung Fu martial arts, Bruce Lee, it got a lot of traction in cities like New York because of the sense that you weren't safe right. and you need to be able to defend yourself. You know what I mean? It's super interesting to me how martial arts and MMA and mixed martial arts, all that stuff has, for the most part in America, hmm. unlike let's say other countries like Brazil, has been in the last you know decade or couple of decades just simply been a sport. Hmm. It hasn't really been something, I mean, people have taken the sport on, but they've taken, it's much more of a sport than it was then. It's less of a self, thought of as a, you know, a mode of self-defense. Right. You know, which is super interesting, right? And I feel like that's another thing that, you know, in making comparisons about the 70s and where we're going, because I think that's what you were kind of suggesting. I'd love to hear what you have to say about that because I've also got a lot of thoughts. I think the flip side of that coin is that you know, what does that mean for security? Mm. And we've gotten used to in cities like New York having tremendous levels of security. We can walk around and feel perfectly secure. You're not worried you're going to get mugged right. in the street or you're going to get hit over the head or you're going to drive down. My dad used to, he was a resident at Brooklyn Hospital in New York. We lived in Astoria, Queens. Mm. If I left my bike out at night, it got stolen. He had has stories about this driving to work and people would just throw bottle caps at his car. Mm. Yeah, a shitty little Toyota. It's not like there was any reason to throw bottle caps at him. <laughs> and uh, you know, a doctor got knifed in the in the elevator. Yeah. Got murdered in the elevator. Yeah. And nurses were selling sodas out of the machines, taking the sodas out, selling them. Yeah. And in some cases, babies. My dad. These are stories from my father. But babies were dying in the ICU. I mean, it was. Yeah. Wow. It was a totally different time than it is today in New York. New York now is a highly commercialized, That's whitewashed a city. Completely different. Although we are avoiding the elephant in the room in this conversation about what you know, what sort of New York are we talking about here? We talk about that New York pre pre March two thousand and twenty or post March twenty twenty because I don't know what the future of New York is going to be. Right. But, but let's just, leaving that aside. I of course you know grew up thinking about New York through the prism of all of those stories. Right. It was that became the prevailing image. 
you know, I ended up absolutely loving New York after I, you know, moved to this area. I first came as a student in 1993. But even then, 1993, that, you know, the city was starting to be cleaned up significantly. The prevailing perception, the, the stereotype for, you know. The warriors, like from the, the movie yeah, The Warriors. Yeah, I was terrified. I, I, I landed, right. I came in, I remember getting a bus from JFK whatever Greyhound type bus thing they had going that what was those things, the Jiminy things and getting into Grand Central and, you know, wondering what the hell I was. And then I just, people were offering me cab rides and I was just like saying no. And then I, I walked to this one hostel that I'd managed to find a place to stay and lugging my bags through there. I was terrified. Very quickly fell in love with it though. And a matter of days later, I was realizing that this was just an enormously overwhelmingly stimulating city but you know i studied at cornell and so i was up there in ithaca but before i went there i met this girl who is now my wife in the sort of brief one week period that i was in new york city before i was going up to ithaca and then that was it i kept coming down to see her as often as i could and she was living on 104th and broadway and sleeping there at night, you'd still hear gunshots, you know, not very often, but, you know, 104th was fine, but she told me never walk down 109th. 109th, and you'd look at it, it was this dark kind of, there were, you know, it was, it was <laughs> yeah, ten, ten, tenement, tenement housing. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, Harlem now, I mean, my sister-in-law yeah. lives there now. I mean, I mean, yeah, she said there's we no way. We avoided Harlem like the plague. Oh, we didn't go through Harlem. Yeah, my, we my, avoided my, it. My wife's Puerto Rican and she's, you know, of significantly darker skin color than I am. So she was like, we can go up to 125th Street, but you are not going on your on your own. You're coming with me, you know. So you know, it was, yeah, it was a tougher time, and it was just one of those things. But it's amazing how quickly it turned around. I mean, to think how fast that got removed, which I think was a very hopeful thing, right? It made, it was, you know, there's all sorts of debate. People have been talking about it for years about how and what it, whether it was, you know, the the broken windows policy or whether it was just economic growth or or what it was that succeeded in turning New York around. But it's such an important mess. It's, whatever it is, it's really important. I th the most important thing for me was it's very hopeful, right? To see this city that was stereotypically, you know, almost like a hellhole, you know, is, is the way it was described and thought of, to then become once again this shining symbol of progress and multiculturalism and sort of vibrant new ideas and everything else. It was very inspiring. So, I mean, I don't know. That's why you know I'm feeling pretty melancholy about this thing. I, I haven't actually been into the city. I, I live in Westchester in, in Pelham, and I've really yeah, just it's a nice been, area. Yeah, it's nice, and it's actually much easier, I think, to social distance in a place like this because totally we, we can get out a bit. I live in a bigger house, and it's not just a crammed apartment. But you know, it's the city. You know, I was listening to Roger Cohen's podcast version of his "I Forgive You, New York." op-ed that he wrote for the New York oh, Times. Oh, man. I heard that on the uh, Daily. Oh, on the Daily. That was so relatable. Oh, yeah. Cause, so you know, interesting. Yeah. Tell our listeners we didn't hear what that was. So, yeah. So, Roger Cohen is, a, like me, a transplant, right? He's uh, He's got this sort of British South African, almost sounds like an Aussie, but he's not. He's a South African Brit, very successful journalist for the New York Times. And so, he, like me, has grew up to love and the city is something that you'd kind of were transplanted into but he basically goes to the thing and says i forgive you new york and starting to tear up as i talk about it but um, he starts <laughs> listing he starts listing all of the things that you kind of annoy you a bit about new york and he goes on about Times square and the the cramped subways and the people that you know the noise in the streets and the the, the blaring fire engines and all sorts of things that, that are you know, part of that kind of hubbub and noise and chaos and some of the most difficult aspects of living in New York. And then it all stops and it goes quiet and disappears. And it's so sad to not hear the sirens or to see the tourists buzzing through Times Square as cheesy as that all is. And the, he goes through every aspect of the city and says, I forgive you. Yeah. I forgive you in New York. Oh, <laughs> The piece is titled Come Back, yeah. New York, All is Forgiven. All is Forgiven, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he had, there's this one part, he says, all is forgiven if you will only return. The subway soliloquies of the homeless, the trains oh, that yeah. never come, the trains that stop in the middle of the tunnel, <laughs> the traffic, the garbage trucks blocking cross streets, the jackhammer of construction, <laughs> the hiss of smoke from a manhole cover, the idle stretched limos, SUVs. Oh. And I, I heard that and I was like, yeah, 
Yeah. You know, th- I hate this shit. Yeah, right, of <laughs> like, course. But yes, I miss people. Yeah, you miss, I have all. Beautiful. I miss people, man. Yeah. I have a place out of the city mm-hmm. that I, I retreated to with my family and my girlfriend, who has a place right next door, and mm. we've all kind of just been together. Yeah, it's been cool. very fortunate yeah. to have this situation. But, you know, I was just saying this today. I was speaking with someone about this, and I said that. You know, as much as I, and when I came here, and I have a studio set up, a makeshift studio in my basement out here, which I had set up, and it, it was perfect. I mean, you couldn't have asked for a better situation. I know a lot of other podcasters that didn't have something like this set up, and they've had to really endure crappy audio for a while mm. during this period. So I had nothing to complain about, right? But I knew when I got here that the programs, the shows wouldn't be as good because they weren't going to be in person. And when they're in person, they're just better. You and I did it in person the last time. And the fact that we did it in person is what I think allows us to be able to have this conversation today, Mm. the way that we're having it, right? But it hasn't been until today where I really felt, I think is a combination of the good weather and it doesn't bring me the same level of joy. Something's missing. The magic Mm. of the in-person conversation, Mm -hmm. meeting someone. You know, when I met you for the first time, I think actually it was at the, uh, we weren't yet at our CMD studio. You came to our, it was a huge space that we had, right? It was a gorgeous studio, right? Yeah, but your elevator Um, wasn't working and I had to take the side elevator, I uh, think, right? uh, Oh, never mind, never mind. Okay, so then you were at CMD. Okay, right. So that the old dude that took us up from the service elevator, yeah, yeah, he's a great guy. We were probably joking around. So, you know, I miss that. I miss being with people and and I realized that, you know, that's, The thing about New York, New York is, if nothing else, a jungle of people. Mm -hmm. If you don't love people, New York's a tough place. Right. You know, and if you love people, it makes it a lot easier. And I love people. I love hanging out with people, seeing people. And I miss people. I miss them. You know, Jimmy Kimmel had this really funny bit like a month ago or so ago. I don't know if you saw it. And he said, uh, you know, shit really hit the fan. And the uh, Kimmel house last night, I uh, told my wife that- I want to see other people. And she, you know, <laughs> she's like, no, she's like, I want to see other people. Ah, you know, and yeah. I, I miss seeing people, man. Yeah, yeah. I miss it. Colbert had a really funny one as well. It's a similar vein where it was like they used, you know, one of those soft voices as if it's a, an ad for some porn. And it was like, you know, just saying, <laughs> and it was just like, have we got something for you? Old people's <laughs> birthday parties touching hands, shaking hands, and like just that kind of like <laughs> sultry voice talking about ordinary connections with people like shaking hands and hugs, lots of hugs. You know? <laughs> it was very clever because it's in just that human contact. Yeah, it's really hard. I mean, the thing I loved about New York though, you know, that I think is what makes me really, you know, really quite melancholy about what's happened. I, re- I just, is that was a celebration of the value of diversity, right? It was like, it's too big and too weird and too multifaceted for any dominant culture to take control of, right? There's, it comes its own culture, right? Which is a kind of like the Swiss, right? It merges into one, all these different voices, and they all sort of compete and argue and fight like the Swiss do, but they all stand up for one thing. They were New Yorkers, right? We're Swiss. And ultimately, that diversity within it you know, produces all of its energy. And, totally. And so to to see it actually sort of manifest in a city is wonderful because you can point to it and see it and celebrate, you know, some of the values that I stand for or believe in, which is like give everybody a shot, you know? And the idea that now the default is going to be distance. And, you know, I moved to the suburbs – for very practical reasons, but the whole time I was like, I don't, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do it. I, 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 you know, I grew up in Perth, Western Australia, which is a very suburban city, and I knew that that suburban mindset was not something, something that I just wasn't comfortable with. And once I started traveling, I lived in all these big cities. I was in Bangkok for a year of my life. I did, you know, then was in New York for six years, and then I was in in the Jakarta for a couple of years, and then we back in New York for six, and then did. A chunk of time in Argentina, and anyway, once we left Argentina, I had you know a couple of kids with us, and we we're like, well, the city's going to be hard at this stage, so let's go near the city. And Pelham's right on the edge of it. And it's actually, I've grown to like it here, but for the first three or four years, I was like, I'm as soon as these kids are out of here, I'm going straight back to the city, man. <laughs> <laughs> now, now it's like you know, I eventually grew you know to like living here. It's a very accessible place. I can get in and out of the city very quickly. I can get to other places quickly, so it's, yeah. it's good. But you know, a part of me was always saying, no, I'm, as soon as we're done, I'm getting that, you know, 
get two bedrooms somewhere that I, if I can afford it somewhere else and do something there. But now I don't know. What, I've got no idea what the future holds because this is this is going to last. I mean, it's not ever going to be something that we can see as a, you know, I think you had these early economic assessments of what, what had happened. And so it'll be, it'll be a V-shaped thing, right? Because it's a supply shock. It's just, it's just stopped and then it starts again. You know, this sort of economic modeling that you get, but you know, this is the deep scarring and the paranoia and the models that just the fact that we can actually do podcasts like this, we can do these things. I agree with you. It's, not what I want to be, and it's not ideal. But the fact that you can, along with the fact that people are fearful, and there's lawsuits and all sorts, you know, I, I don't know. I, I hate to be pessimistic, but I feel like New York's going to have a hard time coming back. Who's going to ride the subway? When are people going to start riding the subway again? Crowded trains, you know. Well, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts about that. First of all, I think. Many people will ride the subways because they have to. Mm. And this speaks to the issue of the injustice and inequality mm -hmm. of our society, right? Yep. There's also, you know, I've been speaking to a lot of restaurant owners and landlords and people in commercial real estate in New York. And that industry, the whole hotel hospitality food service industry has been decimated. Jeez, yeah. You know, and, and no one knows how that's going to look. Mm -hmm. It's not going to come back the way it was. Whatever restaurant can reopen, it has to reopen with at least 50% capacity because of social right. distancing. Right. I mean, it's really not clear who wants to go eat. You know, another one of the, I think, consequences, a positive consequence in a sense, as a result of this, is that people have discovered that they didn't need to go out for a lot of the stuff that they could do at home. Right. Like yeah. cook or make coffee. <laughs> you don't really need to go get coffee outside mm. of the home. Mm. You can do it at home, you know, but most people... Go get coffee for all sorts of reasons. One of them is social. Right. Same thing with me. I like to go see the same people in the morning and go through a routine and say hi and have a quick conversation. But, you know, this other thing that I've been thinking about, and I do want to make sure, and we will talk about this, Michael, but one of the reasons I wanted to have you on is because, and I will have mentioned this in the intro, is because you have... You're almost done putting together the consensus, the yeah, first remote, you, truly digital consensus conference. Except that the in, biggest and most difficult part of it is still yet to come, but yes. Right. Yeah. So I'm very curious about that because no, that's your, sure, kind yeah. of the perfect person to talk about this new economy mm. and what it's like trying to repurpose an analog, one of the remaining sort of analog circumstances, mm. you know, events yeah. to the digital world. But I feel like there's this really... We're living in such a bizarre time in so many ways, but one of the ways is this increasingly tenuous link between markets and the economy. Mm. Our economy is cratering right now. Mm -hmm. We have no clue what it's going to look like when it reopens. It doesn't just restart. I mean, they just the fact that it's even been discussed that way shows a profound disconnect with reality. And yet, markets seem to be behaving. And it's not just that they're behaving. We've bought into this story, I think. I certainly have. At least that I don't expect markets to reflect reality anymore. And I, I don't look to make an investment. If I were to invest in the market, for example, I wouldn't do it looking at fundamentals. I mean, no one, no one thinks that way. We have this model in our head, right? This value investing model, buy low, sell high, right. figure out what something's worth, buy it for cheaper, sell it for higher. Right. But that isn't the way to make money anymore. Right. Well, well, there's another piece of that. That was the, you know, the great revered investor of the last 30 years, you know, Warren Buffett was even, you know, yes, buy low, sell high, but value investing, right? Look at what its return is, work that out, you know, don't buy this, buy that based on based on its underlying fundamentals, right? The ultimate sort of fundamental way of investing. And, and what did there. he say recently? He sees nothing he's attractive. Nothing attractive, right? And I also get the impression he doesn't know what to do anymore, like other than just sell. But at the same time, you know, the market is not back to where it was, but I'm glad you've asked and gone down this path because my column, as, as I will now do another plug for, I'm now writing a weekly newsletter, Money Reimagined, which has a column that publishes on Coindesk on Fridays. And this How do people get on that list? They right. just go to Coindesk? Coindesk and search on newsletters and you'll find the bottom, if you scroll to the bottom of the page, on the, there's also a newsletter. I can link here. to it in the summary That'd of this be great. as well. That'd be great. Yeah. Sure. So you can sign up for the newsletter. It comes out at, you know, around 11 o'clock on Friday mornings. And it's an exploration of these radical changes that I think are 
basically going to happen to our financial and monetary system, not only as a result of COVID-19, but all of the technological changes that are coming at the same time and all the preceding geopolitical issues. In fact, you know, you're and my you and my friend Nathaniel Whitmore, who his podcast, The Breakdown, we've done a joint special consensus distributed edition of the breakdown money reimagined a four-part series just looking at this confluence of forces that are essentially we think going to lead us into this you know reimagined monetary environment anyway that's what we're doing but this week's column is pretty much precisely what we're talking about and i started off by thinking about a piece i wrote when i was at the journal in 2012 you know we're still in the midst of the fallout from the crisis. The Fed is throwing money like crazy. Well, back then it seemed crazy. Now it's a completely different level of crazy. There was still normal eight now. and yeah, a half, eight, yeah, eight and a half percent unemployment. There was, you know, four million homes have been foreclosed. The European debt crisis was raging. People were, you know, still really, really in difficult circumstances. And at that time, Edvard Munch's painting, The Scream sold for $116 million, the highest I remember ever, that. right? And I, I remember, remember thinking the contrast, my God, of this moment of deep deflation, whether or not it literally means falling prices, deflationary in the sense that there's no way to revive growth in my income, was the sort of defining feature of for the vast majority of people's lives. But this sliver of human beings what would, they had so much money they didn't want to know what to do with. They were throwing it into rare art. By the way, two years prior, 2010, more deeply was the prior record, and it was a Picasso sold for $105 million. So the point is, I see rare art as scarcity, right, as a thing that we know has some value. And you know what? I've got money that's burning a hole in my pocket. So what am I going to buy? I could buy some gold. I could buy some stocks that, you know, particularly stocks that are creating where there is scarcity being created by buybacks that are reducing the supply, or I could buy this rare art. But in none of those cases, am I really looking at it and saying, I like this asset because of X, Y, or Z. You know, I'm buying Munch because its value is captured in the painting and it's just, or, you know, I'm buying stocks because of the return. I'm literally buying it because it's scarce, because it's a thing that I know is not going to you know, disappear or be replicated. Also in the case of art and gold, depending on how you buy it, because mm-hmm. you can shield it from the government. For well, government decides issue, that it wants yeah. to, ta- that's, a huge, yeah. that's a huge part of that, right? And that brings us back again to the inequality between the very, very, very wealthy and well-connected and everybody else. Absolutely. Yeah. You've got the ability to like, so, you know, to get into a Sotheby's auction and have access to that special, this was an anonymous over the phone bidder, right? You, oh, you're, I bet it was. You're let in, <laughs> yeah. You're let in through the door because of your ties and connections to the most senior people at Sotheby's, right? It's like the special privilege access to a Swiss bank account, right? So my point in this piece was to say there was no inflation happening at all in the broad swath of the economy. But that's not to say there wasn't inflation. There was asset inflation because the financialization, which is to your point about markets dictating everything, that was the vehicle through which the Fed's largesse was making its way into the world, meaning it was into the hands of the financiers and the wealthy who owned those those assets. And so their world was one of inflation, of having money burning a hole in their pocket and having to go off and buy rare art with it, right? So this the the sheer the bifurcation is just so stark and it's a direct result of what you started out this conversation being, which is to say we're financial market dependent because that's how the Fed, you know, once once corporate bonds, you know, and this takes us back to our earlier conversation, this is Milken, right? I mean, those were wonderful inventions. So regardless of, you know, Milken's crimes, the notion that you could raise money through junk bonds and there could be a pricing mechanism for that, the notion that you could have mortgage-backed securities so that people could start to, you know, liquidate, you could bring in funding for housing, all of that was actually a pretty good thing for juicing the economy. But it meant that We got more and more away from the traditional means by which credit flowed through the economy, which was via person-to-person banking relationships. And instead, these bonds, these assets that could be moved from one person to another, and the prices at which they traded became the mechanism by which everything else was priced, right? So now the Fed, the way it tries to move the needle and inspire credit in the economy is to buy as many bonds as it can to drive down yields 
to then have a knock-on effect of lower interest rates that might eventually trickle their way down so that mum and pop can sort of take out a small, small business loan. But along the way, all it's doing is pouring money into the fat cats who sit as the intermediaries in that process. Yeah. So I wonder if this is just a big lie and how much everyone's complicit in this lie that lowering interest rates is a way to juice the economy. There are components of that, but primarily the bailouts that were conducted after 2008 were about saving asset prices. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, that's where it was right. first and foremost. Yeah, and I, and I think the further the Fed has gone down this path of buying an ever, ever wider array of assets, the further it gets away from being able to make that argument and the bigger the lie looks, right? So, but I mean, if they wanted to save the, but I just, you know, just to say this, yeah. if they were really interested in juicing the economy, and that, that's actually sort of a pejorative way of talking about it, if they were really interested in restarting the economy, they would do fiscal spending. They wouldn't lower right. interest rates and monetize treasury bonds or purchase huge amounts of treasury bonds that expand the Fed balance sheet. That would not be the way right. to fight a deflationary environment. Right. But that's a whole other story, right? Because that's a fiscal, that's a federal government's responsibility. But basically, and in some respects, this brings us back to Volcker and Alan Greenspan, because the success of Volcker meant that central bankers got elevated to this kind of hero status. Mm. And you know, at the same time, you know, I don't think that these are necessarily cause and effect, but you had the breakdown of American political discourse. And so gridlock in Congress and sort of the culture wars and the division that came with that meant that it was much harder for politicians to kind of collectively find consensus around fiscal solutions to anything. And instead, what we got were politicized, you know, things. So this bailout series now with, you know, whether it's airlines and Boeing or hotels and you know Trump wanting to give money to cruise lines, right? I mean, all of that as opposed to what's most desperately needed, which is money in the hands of human beings, all of that's the politics and the breakdown of the political system. So the means by which you could actually use fiscal policy to drive growth were undermined by politics at the same time that the narrative on Wall Street, which we'd come to sort of treat as a god, was that trust the central bankers, they'll get us out of this. And Greenspan, if you remember, until he you know, fell from grace before the crisis, mm. was a hero to everybody. He was the guy who just by mm. tweaking interest rates here and there could achieve the Goldilocks economy, right? This perfect- The maestro, not too the, maestro. the maestro. The markets yeah. played to his tune. Yeah. So that's that was it. So, the, so the, the idea was the best things that a government could do was just to take their hands off the lever and let it go automatically, right? And just- let the central bankers just tweak things and the market will do what's rest and left. And, you know, this was also, I think, you know, to put this in historical context, it was the end of the Cold War. This is through the 90s, right? Everything was working. Didn't matter. Even even the Asian crisis, as bad as that was for many in the world, the US came out of it looking really good because they had the internet boom that they basically saved everybody. And, you know, so it was this view that laissez-faire free market models will work. And I think that entrenched the notion that, you know, remember we had the end of the welfare state at that point, really sort of a hardline positions on, you know, workfare and things like that. So any notion that the federal government would give handouts to anybody was anathema, you know, which is ironic, right? Because we've just, you know, we're talking about trillions of dollars in bailout money, but of course it made its way into the hands of you know, favored political donors and things. You know, the narrative on in Wall Street still is largely, you know, at least from the right, but I would say there's sort of moderate Democrats who feel the same way, is that you don't you really don't do handouts because that's just gonna people aren't gonna work hard enough, right? It's a disincentive. So these things come together and I think there was just impotence at the federal level, the government level. And now all we're left with is the Fed just being at, all they can do is just throw as much money as they can at it, and it's increasingly impotent. Did you see Jared Dillian's piece in Bloomberg a couple of weeks ago? No, he just what, made a, was it was a great piece. It just basically said money is losing its meaning, and he just said once you start hearing numbers like two trillion dollars in bond purchases, if you look at what the Fed's balance sheet looks like, that they have bought two point five trillion dollars in bonds, including ETFs and corporate junk, everything, right? 
And so interesting. What does that mean anymore? Two trillion dollars of money is supposed to be something that we understand. Whether or not you're where you stand on fiat versus hard money is kind of irrelevant, even in a context of a you know fiat currency political environment. Everybody still intuitively understood that money is something that has to have a certain scarcity function to it. Now it's just like unlimited QE. They call it QE, infinity QE is what they call it, right? And so what does it mean anymore? And that's that's a really profound and important question. What does now money mean? I don't know how you ever get back from that question. I think for the time being, we're just trying to just put band-aids on everything and therefore no one's even asking those questions. But at some point, we're going to have to pay the piper and say, what is this anymore? You know? Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts about that, man. This question of what does it mean? This question of meaning and loss of meaning and nihilism. I've talked about it as a form of nihilism. I've done episodes on this with different guests. I think the one in particular that stands out is one with Grant Williams and Ben Hunt. But I've talked about this with other people. I've felt this. And I, I've also felt that money is now more important than it's ever been before. Hmm. And yet it's less accessible than hmm. it's ever been before. And it's presented as the solution to all the problems that exist in society, many of which have nothing to do with money, but with a lack of purpose and meaning. And I think about the younger generations, people that are coming out of college right now, or they're in college during what is a tragedy if you are in college. To be in college, especially you know The Daily, which does great work. I think it's a podcast that everyone should try and listen to. Not all the podcasts that they release are ones that I may be interested in, mm -hmm. but they do a lot of really great work. And they had this one episode they released recently where it told the story of a student who was living at home back in Florida who had gotten a scholarship to go to a college that was very expensive college, a liberal arts college, you know, that funds a distribution of scholarships at the bottom through money that it brings in from many wealthy students. And the teacher was doing this remotely. The professor was doing the classes remotely. And here is this one student. And she writes a, this email that when she read it to the reporter at the New York Times was tearing up. And it was about how she couldn't write the final essay. She couldn't complete it because she was in the midst of this family drama. You know, the family business was down. She didn't know if she'd be able to to continue to, you know, focus on school or have to go back to work. And she felt like it was all for nothing. And I just think about how I don't know what I would do if I was that age. And I think that there's this quality of out of sight, out of mind. I listen to a lot of talking heads on TV. They're totally disconnected. This COVID crisis, no one's talked about. No one's really talking about the impact to the real economy and to real people, many of whom have to go to work. And I don't think it's enough to just send checks in the mail, man. You know, <laughs> I did this other episode with uh, Michael Lind and he reframed this for me because for years I talked about this and I thought about this, but I thought about this in terms of wealth inequality, in terms of this phenomenon that we were touching on before I've talked about with lowering, lowering of interest rates because you need more and more debt fueled asset price levitation and growth. And that's the way that you can maintain this growing gap of inequality of wealth. But he talked about it in terms of power. Hmm. And that really resonates with me. And we have this just gulf of power opening up in society and a larger and larger percentage of people that are not only destitute of assets, but in cases like this, destitute of hope and opportunity and meaning. Yeah. Meaning, you yeah. know, and I think at a fundamental way, people need to feel a sense of purpose for their life to have meaning. And meaning's important. Again, I'm, I'm reminded again of another guest. We had Rebecca Goldstein, who I love. I love mm. Rebecca. And she wrote a, a book. Well, it wasn't about the book she had written. She's written a number of books. She's written a book on Girdle, too. But also, she wrote Plato at the Googleplex, which is the book I read. And mm -hmm. I had her on for that. But she has been doing a lot of work around what she calls mattering philosophy, which is really like moral philosophy, Aristotelian questions of what is the good life. Mm. And I, I think that we've totally lost the ball. Right. We've lost it. Somewhere along the way, we lost it, man. And I think that we've pretended, and it's part of this also, this larger globalization. I think this is where you get the message of the Steve Bannons really resonates with people. This part, this thing about, you know, bringing it back to America, bringing our supply chains back home, taking back control. Mm. Because I think that 
the narrative that pervaded the commanding heights narrative of the 90s in you know the go-go period the bill clinton we were on top of the world yeltsin on the white house lawn we won it's the future full spectrum dominance that wasn't enough mm. it's not enough to just get richer it's not enough europe is not a, is not a it, or at least you know before this crisis or everything else it was not a better place it was a better place before that when it was more diverse when the countries in Europe were more diverse, when you went from one country to another and you felt like you were a different country, there weren't as many McDonald's. Mm. It wasn't, you know, this culture of globalization. And I think we've discounted that. It's a really important point. Because I, 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 for some time, you know, felt like I associated with globalization in a positive sense. And, and I think it's because I'd framed it differently. Like I saw it as a vehicle for, you know, Interconnection for I was about to. So did I, by the way. By the way, so did I. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, exactly. So it was always I thought this is it. It's of course we can buy things from China, and of course there's you know this. It was it was isolationist and and nationalist to to do otherwise, right? And it meant travel, and it meant all these positive things. But to your point, you just made which is a really interesting one, right? Like so, I had it as an image of diversity, but in fact. There really was as monolithic culture is one thing about it. I, you know, I think there's some truth to that. That ultimately we we ended up with you know McDonald's everywhere, right? The Starbuckization of everything. That's one aspect of it. But I think even more pernicious and problematic was the sort of the monolith of policy prescriptions, right? That there's only one way to do anything, and that is specifically is the case with economics because the dollar was the you know it just became the asset everybody had to have, which again is a topic in this week's Money Reimagined newsletter out tomorrow. Make sure you sign up at Coindesk. Sorry. I'll, I'll, make sure to, <laughs> I'll make sure to uh, drill that point home in the intro right. and uh, as well as the consensus so, conference as well, Michael. Thank you, my man. Uh, but ultimately, the dollar just becomes therefore almost an indirect conduit of optimal policy because you can't play outside that rule anymore, right? You're not allowed to. Because if you do, your currency gets trashed. So whether or not it's, it, oh, you know, yeah. we, we frame it in global anti-globalist terms about the IMF, and that's partly true. I, I never put it in the context of conspiracy theories, but it is true that the dollarization of the world meant that everybody is to some extent beholden to American monetary policy. And American oh, monetary policy, as we said before, was elevated to this level of fix everything that Greenspan and Volcker had done for us. So ultimately, the whole world was now operating under this single mindset. And it doesn't work. I mean, it hasn't worked, right? So uh, at least in terms of crisis management, and it certainly hasn't worked in terms of people getting to the pursuit of happiness, the, the the meaning that you were talking about, right? If, if at the end of the day, what we're trying to do, whether it's through economic growth, unemployment or whatever, is just have a better life, it's pretty hard to argue that it's been successful for a lot of people. Now, it's that that may also be, you know, as I, I really don't know where I stand on all this, to be honest, because that, that also might just be an entirely privileged first world perspective, right? What What is a privileged the, to, to, first see, world to, perspective? To see this whole last 20 years as being a deterioration of the world, because maybe if I'm somebody in China or in Indonesia or in any other country that's, you know, as now has a longer life expectancy or has, you know, reduced poverty and all those sorts of things that, you know, this is the greatest thing ever. My life has improved, right? So, you know, globalization has had its, it's very hard to argue that globalization hasn't resulted in significant reductions in poverty around the world. Now, a lot of that- Question is, is how, how much China. of that is sustainable? Right. And once we get to a new equilibrium, how much of that- Right. Is, it, is that been... all smoke and mirrors as well, right? So there's huge- right. We know a lot of it is. We know a lot of it is. Right, right, right. And who gets to pay the price of those smoke and mirrors, right? That's the other thing. Of this. Now, now, I just saw, and put this into my column, or to, into, into a newsletter, a little piece pointing out that there's been a surge in Bitcoin transactions in sub-Saharan Africa, right? So right now, there's a scramble for dollars. Dollars are in shortage everywhere. This is why the Fed has, you know, suddenly poured 2.5 trillion of them into the world because everybody needs dollars because it's a margin call on on their debts and it's this horrible vicious cycle 
So I'm sure that translates into the developing world, literally there being no dollars, right? So literally that, that you can't get cash. And we don't know this because we're all on social distancing. So there's no journalists from CNN floating around sub-Saharan Africa right now trying to look into what's happening in, you know, in Tanzania or, or in Rwanda or, or asking questions about the state of life in these places. We're living in you know, almost this weird blackout. Meanwhile, those places – if money is the lifeline that we're saying it is, and it's being taken away from them, and they're having to use local currencies that nobody trusts because it's all just falling apart, no wonder they're starting to turn to Bitcoin, right? It's literally the only thing they can do. So, yeah. so I think there's so many questions out there about who's going to pay the price for all this, about what does the world look like afterwards. But it is possible, I think, notwithstanding the horrible pain that people are going to go through in places like that, but also you know, on our own doorstep here, and you talked about the people who have to ride the subway, for example. But notwithstanding all of that, that there's something about this crisis that makes you really ask the kind of questions you were just asking. Where is the meaning? What does it actually mean? And, and it might have sounded hokey before, but you're now like, no, this is it. So I thought like when Trump announced the $1,200 checks that were getting mailed out and still haven't arrived, right? And we got held up because he wanted to put his stupid- He wanted to put drug. his name on it. Unbelievable. It was unbelievable. Unbelievable. It was so horrible. Totally unbelievable. <laughs> totally, uh, we all know why he did it, of but course. it's still unbelievable. Reminiscent still of, unbelievable. Of, of the, him throwing his paper towels to the Puerto Ricans in the middle of the- But know, even worse. It's even worse. worse. It's far worse. Even worse. But anyway, putting that aside, uh, <laughs> right. the, 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 we had this, you know, talking about this actually with Nathaniel on the breakdown of podcast, and we were just talking about like, okay, what, what do they need? People don't actually need dollars right now. That's not what they need. They need food and they need they need masks, right? We need to get masks. Doctors need masks. That's what the world needs. Money is purely the means by which we get those masks. But right now, the most absolutely urgent thing to get into their hands is not dollars at all, right? So to me, that was a really – we were like able to – okay, why does money exist? It's, it's a means to an end. And it isn't a means to an end when – when we elevate it to this cultural icon that is a measure of our own power and everything else, and, and then we're in an environment we are we're able to project that power in some way, then money has a different meaning. But when you get down to brass tacks and it's all about raw survival, suddenly it's secondary to the thing that you need, which is a mask <laughs> or a meal, right? Yeah, no, I have so many thoughts. It's also really fascinating that the Bitcoin cultural phenomenon is a phenomenon around money. It makes sense, hmm. right? Based on everything we've just discussed, right? The important role that money has played, the capture of money, everything. By the way, we're recording this on Thursday evening, May May 7th. The news about that leaked investor letter by Paul Tudor Jones mm -hmm. that came out, yeah. that's a really big deal. That is a big you know? deal. Because I mean, I, I, you know, a big part of, of Bitcoin's potential for success is ultimately a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. You know, it's about more people buying in. The fact that Paul bought in, I mean, that's a pretty big deal. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I buy into this idea that it it's like gold. You know, Paul would know better than me <laughs> if it reminds yeah. him of gold in the early 70s, but that is a big deal, Yeah, you know? Yeah, and, and, I, and I think that it talks to a little bit what I was trying to say before, you know, because the, the end of the newsletter is to focus on, okay, so if I'm in a situation where, you know, I've got money that needs to go into something and I can think of rare art as something that is scarce and therefore will, you know, sustain its value as opposed to the, you know, disappearing value of this meaningless money, then how does Bitcoin stand within those parameters, right? How does it stand up to that test? And the thing is, well, its whole purpose is to be scarce. That is what it is. Like it's not like what is Bitcoin for? Bitcoin is scarcity. It is digital scarcity. It is mathematical scarcity. And the fact that that is something valuable, specifically in the context of money, is really, really interesting and really, really, you know, potentially powerful at a time like this. So, yeah. so I think that like, and, and of course, it's going to be the guys who were, would otherwise buy the rare art, like you know Paul Tudor Jones, or or it would be, you know, who are going to drive this thing to where it would go. Now, 
He's buying futures. He's not buying the actual, you know. So he's even he's still not even buying quite into the narrative. Right, that's he interesting. Own, he did, buying that's interesting. Shit, he didn't. He didn't. Still. He didn't. He didn't. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. So he didn't buy physical quote physical Bitcoin. Right, he bought, but, but he's buying an exposure to the idea that other people are buying it. Right. So it's still validation. It, it's a well. I think for me, when I hear a guy like Paul buy in, for me, the reason why that makes my ears perk up is not so much because I think that it will cause a gold rush into Bitcoin, but rather that for me, one of the biggest risks for Bitcoin's success is that it could be regulated out of existence, that people living in the United States would not be able to actually own it unless they own it offshore. If they left the country, fine, fine, fine. But the US is an enormous economy. And so like when you get more and more people like that, to me, that makes it harder and harder to do that without mm. exacting costs on people who are plugged into the government, mm. right? But Mike, I want to I want us to move it into the overtime mm -hmm. well, because that... I was originally, my idea was to actually release this on the premium feed. But this is, again, I, I think I did this once with Nick Carter and people loved it. And I've been hesitant to do these types of things with no rundown, but they just turn out so great. I'm going to move it into the overtime. Okay. I want to continue to talk about BTC. I want to talk about consensus. Yeah, and I the do experience want to talk of, about it. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. The experience of doing that. You know, one of the other things that I, I want to mention that came up when we were talking that I want to discuss is this decoupling that's happened in recent decades between the cost of living inflation, consumer price inflation, and asset price inflation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a huge phenomenon. And I, and I think- to your point, perhaps, about the 1970s, this decade becomes increasingly more relevant and I think points the way to where we might be going because I've done some episodes on supply chains. I did one with the CEO of the Institute for Supply Management, ISM, that puts up the ISM number. I did an episode mm. with the VP of Government relations, I forget the exact title of Lowell Randall's for the Cold Chain Alliance, which is basically everything, mm -hmm. you know, that we eat for food, everything that's cold, you know, steaks, vegetables, you name it, anything that, that needs to be refrigerated. refrigerated. Mm. And there are many reasons to foresee prices, the cost of living going up, mm. right? So you could see simultaneously deflation and asset prices while you have inflation in the cost of living. Also, you mentioned Nathaniel's podcast. I got to say, I was on the breakdown. Shout out to Nathaniel. Mm. I've done a few interviews recently. It's the first time that I've been interviewed in like years, and it's something I'm trying to get get better at. I rambled oh, a bunch. Oh, you're good. I'm, I heard it. it was I am also working on answering the question, what is hidden forces, <laughs> which I, I struggle to answer. I'm almost like, why, why? If you don't know that, don't ask me. I don't know the answer to that, but I'm, but, I'm working on that. Maybe the answer to, to what is hidden forces is like, what is hidden forces? Like you come back with a question, right? Because it is <laughs> exactly the, the question is the answer in some way, you know. So, right. Yeah. It's like I'm like Prince. Prince. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It's, yeah, it's yeah. A question. An, an answerable question. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, no, I, I actually came. I've come to a much clearer idea of what it is. And part of it is that I felt that the answer I had to give was kind of pompous. It really is looking at the hidden forces. You know, the underlying forces that are driving the things that we see every day. But Michael, I'm going to move it to the overtime okay. and I want to continue this conversation. I also really want to talk about Bitcoin. And as I said, I'm very curious to hear what it's been like for you to produce with your team consensus, because this may be the, the future that we have to live in for the next few years. And your experience, I think, will be educational to me for sure, because I love live events and I miss doing them and I don't know how on earth I'm going to do them but for many other people as well. For regular listeners, you know the drill. If you're new to the program or if you haven't subscribed yet to our audiophile, autodidact, or super nerd tiers, head over to patreon.com slash hidden forces or scroll down to the summary section of this week's episode and click on the link that sends you to the Patreon page as well as to the link that has instructions for how to integrate the RSS link to your favorite podcast application of choice so you can listen to my conversation with Michael just like you listen to the regular podcast. Michael, stick around. We're going to pick it up on the other side of this overtime. Great. Today's episode of Hidden Forces was recorded in New York City. For more information about this week's episode or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.com. Io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to overtime segments, episode transcripts, 
and show rundowns full of links and detailed information related to each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website or through our Patreon page at patreon.com slash hidden forces. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.